Okay, who have we got next? We have Dr. Jorge Vargo from the European Space Agency talking to us next. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me right. well? We yes. can. I'm really excited about this. David was singing your praises just now, saying, oh, he's brilliant. He knows everything about Mars. We've had so many questions about Mars, about water on yeah, Mars. Yeah, we saved everything. up all the tricky ones for you, so I hope you're feeling uh, yeah. confident. <laughs> and lots about life on Mars yes. as well. Everyone wants to know, is there life on Mars? When are we going to find life on Mars? How, are we, how will we know if we find life on Mars? So, But let's, okay. uh, let's start with uh, your, your presentation and find out a bit more, and then we'll, we'll ask you all these exciting questions at the end. Okay. Okay. Can you share your Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. So give me a second. The, the presentation yeah, should be coming up. Yeah, you see there it? it is. Yes, it's there. Okay, Thank great. You. So let, let's talk a bit about science. And the first question, I guess, that is fair to ask ourselves is why, why go search for life on Mars? And there's really two reasons for doing it. The first one is that conveniently, Mars is relatively close to us. It is not the closest planet to Earth, Venus is closest, but uh, it's, it's, it's the one where uh, there are good chances that life may have gained a foothold. And the reason we think that is because conditions on the surface of Mars were very similar to those on our planet when life appeared on Earth. There were rivers, there were lakes, there was plenty of water, a dense atmosphere. And we're going to see a bit uh, why that is so. Although we need to say that there are other targets in the solar system that could have a uh, promise for life. Uh, namely, some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn have uh, subsurface oceans where perhaps life could have appeared as well. So let us look a bit about uh, Mars. And we need to first ask ourselves what it is that we can tell about the origin of life. Unfortunately, on Earth, most of the rocks that could have recorded this first step of life forms on our planet have disappeared because on Earth we have plate tectonics, the movement of large uh, continental masses causes uh, big chunks of our crust to, to go down into the subsurface and to be recooked. And so uh, a lot of the clues that you would like to study are cooked out of uh, our ability to, to, to probe them. Now, there's two ways to look at the origin of life. The first is going backwards. And that means we start from what we know. Uh, we can start from uh, the analysis of, of, of cells. Um, we can also use chemistry because uh, the cells use molecular uh, machines to do uh, their internal work. And these are based on, on, on the chemistry, in particular organic chemistry. And since a few years back, we can also use uh, the new tools that we, we have with genetic analysis. So that is, we go from what we know about life today backwards, trying to understand what the first protoorganism may have been like. The other way is to go forwards. And that is, we start with the origin of planets, the mechanisms for the formation of planets, and we use universal laws of physics and chemistry to try to understand how from those first building blocks, things could have moved on forward. And somewhere in the middle, we have geology, which is the coming together of minerals and organic chemistry that would have been important for facilitating uh, the first organisms. So let, let's try to take a few steps on this trip. And we're going to start from the, the formation of the terrestrial planets in our solar system. And by terrestrial planets, I mean Venus, Earth, and Mars. They're in the inner part of the solar system. And they grew initially from a, a very large disk of dust 
that uh, circulated or was turning around uh, um, the infant son. Um, and, and these very small fluffy aggregates would stick to each other and grow. It got to a, a size of, let's say, um, a few hundred meters. Um, some of them would start to uh, be seen by others because they had they started to have a bit of gravitational attraction. So then you would have uh, bigger chunks that would come together. Eventually, when they grew even bigger, they would attract objects uh, even more. And so the, the impacts would start to be a bit more violent because the objects uh, approach each other with even more speed. And as you take these to uh, very large objects, then they were attracting uh, material at very high speeds. And, and so when these objects were coming into contact with these infant or protoplanets, they would liberate enormous amounts of energy. So much so that in the beginning, the planets were immense balls of magma where the temperatures were so high that uh, the rocks would melt. And um, eventually, um, these, these uh, protoplanets would start losing heat to space and, and, and cooling down. But if you have been able to walk on the surface of one of these planets, you wouldn't have been able to see much. There would have been water, vapor, and smoke everywhere. Um, you would have seen uh, oceans of lava all over the place with bits of uh, scum floating here and there. Um, as the planets cooled down, they started to uh, outgas from this uh, uh, molten mantle what would become the, the first atmospheres, which were mainly carbon dioxide, water vapor, and nitrogen. And these, these atmospheres were very dense, very hot, and very high pressure, like a pressure cooker. Eventually, they would start losing heat to space. And when the, the temperature of the atmosphere came below what is called the critical point of water, then they were not only able to hold on to all that water vapor in a gaseous state anymore. And then in a matter of a few days, you had like a deluge of water onto the surface. And these created the first oceans, which covered the entire planet. In the case of Earth, there was no um, land anywhere. The whole planet was covered by kilometers of water. And the first emerged lands were what we call today volcanic arcs like what, what you have in the islands of Hawaii. You would have volcanoes that would grow from, uh, from the, uh, the bottom uh, of this ocean, if you like, and you would have little bits of emerged land popping here and there. The planet then started forming what we now call continental crust, and then uh, the first continental masses start to grow by a process involving reactions between water and minerals. So now let's start to put all this that I, that I said onto a graph. On the top part, you see this black bar and you see uh, depicted there the various stages in terrestrial planet formation. So you see at the, on the left, you see that, that sort of molten ball of magma the second stage is the outgassing of these very dense primordial atmospheres. The third stage is the raining down of the global oceans. And this, this is uh, shown in a different way in the bottom chart, where I'm, I'm just showing the first billion years uh, of uh, the planet's history. So from about 4.57 billion years, about until 3.5 billion years which you will know, note is, is the oldest uh, date that we have for what we are sure are traces of life on Earth. Now, 
About 4.4 billion years ago, the ocean temperature became sufficiently cold for organic chemistry reactions to remain more or less stable. And that is what we call the first window of opportunity for life to have appeared on our planet. And in the case of Earth, we know that life has gone on ever since then until today. And this is represented by that long blue bar at the top. Now, there is one other thing that we have to think about when we talk about infant planets, and that is not only when the uh, water appeared on the surface, but also what, how the interior of the planet was cooling down, because this gave rise in the beginning to volcanism everywhere and a lot of hydrothermal activity. So places where fluids and gases were coming from uh, the interior of the earth into the ocean, releasing all kinds of organic uh, uh, a soup of organic molecules and, and interesting fluids. Now, so this is Earth. Let us now move on to Mars. If we look at Mars, the, the beginning is very similar. But then about 3.9, 3.8 billion years ago, Mars took a very wrong turn. We know that very, very quickly, in a matter of perhaps 100 million years, perhaps less, um, something happened to Mars and rapidly lost most of its atmosphere, most of the water it had on the surface, and became the, the very cold desert that it is today. So for the case of Mars, we see that we also have a wind of opportunity, this blue bar that we see at the top. It is just shorter and it's compressed towards the beginning of the history of the planet. Now, this movie tries to show you a little bit of what Mars may have been like four billion years ago. It's missing the volcanoes, I have to say, um, you would have seen uh, clouds of ash um, spewing out of many of these uh, rocky formations. But it, it does show you uh, that there would have been a dense atmosphere and quite a bit of, of water on the surface. In the movie, as we progress, um, then time goes forward. And so you will see that the planet becomes uh, progressively drier. So because we know that a key ingredient for uh, cellular life to function is availability of liquid water, this is telling us that if we want to go search for traces of life on Mars, we have to make a trip back in time. We have to be able to go to the time when water and liquid water was plentiful on the surface. So let us look a bit now of what it is that we have been doing um, as a human species regarding uh, the search for life. So there are a couple of things that we have to keep in mind. The first one is a word called habitability, which is just uh, a one word way to combine everything that makes a certain place and time hospitable to life. The second thing that we need to keep in mind is preservation. That is the biosignatures that we would like to discover and study. If they belong to something that was alive four billion years ago, how do they make that trip? in time from 4 billion years ago to our present day, because we have to be able to recognize them. So it is very important that they be well preserved. So let us look now at 
what has been done for the search for life on Mars. I'm not going to talk about all the missions that have gone to Mars. I'll just describe a few whose discoveries have been very, very important um, because they have allowed us to understand key things about Mars. The first one is uh, the Viking missions. This is uh, the Rolls Royce of planetary missions, or as the Americans like to call them, the Cadillac of the skies. It was uh, two missions that were launched in uh, 1975 with two orbiters and two landers and provided amazing results. But uh, crucially, the Viking landers, which had uh, very capable instruments, failed to detect organic molecules uh, in at, at the um, levels of detection that uh, they could master in the 1970s. And however, the results suggested um, that there had to be some very powerful oxidant mixed in with the Martian soil that could have been responsible for destroying uh, organic molecules. We are Still today, we're uh, looking at the results of Viking. They're fascinating and uh, very, very important. So if we look at uh, um, the surface of Mars today, we can imagine it uh, to be sort of an ocean, but not an ocean of water, an ocean of dust. And this dust is the result of the meteoritic bombardment of the surface over 100 millions of years, which has produced a lot of these uh, particulate material a bit like very sharp sand that gets moved around by the wind. And it's not interesting to us because it, it gets UV sterilized and probably will not find anything there. But what is really interesting for uh, search for life missions are these things called outcrops. Outcrops are like icebergs, is a bit of indigenous or local uh, material that protrudes through this uh, dust. And we can study the tip of the outcrop um, with orbital satellites, for example, and try to understand if these rocks have been laying down in the presence of water, for example. Now, but if we want to study uh, biosignatures, so molecular clues of life, we need to access um, these organic molecules in a good state of preservation. So we need to understand what it is that can destroy them. So the first thing is UV light, but light doesn't penetrate into the terrain. It would just cream or destroy any organisms or any organic molecules that are exposed on the surface. The second thing we have to worry about is oxidants. Oxidants that form due to the action of UV light and can penetrate into the soil. And the last thing is ionizing radiation. This is the radiation that comes from the center of the galaxy, cosmic radiation, that on Earth is stopped by our atmosphere, but on Mars, because the atmosphere is so thin, it penetrates into the subsurface and acts like millions of little knives that destroy the functional groups of the molecules that you would like to study over periods of many hundreds of millions of years. So the way to have access to well-preserved organic molecules is to go below this degradation horizon. And this is what uh, we are trying to do with the ExoMars rover. Um, another thing that has been very, very important for the search for life has been the discovery by Mars Express, which as uh, Dave mentioned was launched in 2003, of large fields of clays because on Earth, most of the organic matter is found in association with the, the finest or the, the smallest mineral grains. And typically, these are clay grains. And clays are formed when volcanic matter falls on water and is able to react with water. And so being able to find clays on Mars was super important. We also learned a lot from a NASA mission that was launched in 2007, Phoenix. Phoenix was the first mission ever to have what is called a wet chemistry lab. And it found this very weird uh, type of oxidant, oops, called uh, perchlorate. This perchlorate is, is that uh, 
thing with the four uh, red balls that you see at the top. Those four red balls are four oxygen uh, atoms. And these perchlorates are mixed in the soil. And when you heat them up, which crucially has been the way we have tried to look for organic molecules on Mars ever since Viking, and also with curiosity, we put uh, a bit of uh, ground or soil into a little oven, we heat it up, and then we look at the organic molecules that come out. And if, they, if these oxidants are heated up and they release those oxygen uh, atoms, then the oxygen oxidizes the organic molecules, turns them into CO2, destroys them, and then that's why we don't see them. So now we understand this, and it is something that we have used also to prepare uh, the chemistry instruments we have in the ExoMars rover. So I'll just mention that uh, the, the ExoMars rover, Rosalind Franklin, combines three key things. This drill to access samples at depth, at two meters. The deepest that anyone has dug on Mars until now is 20 centimeters. That was the Viking landers. So these two meters would be very, very important. So you combine access to the subsurface, mobility on the surface, so you can go to interesting places, and then killer instrumentation, really new stuff uh, to, to try to do the best analysis possible. If you want to learn more about uh, this exciting uh, rover, you can look at these uh, um, articles uh, in the astrobiology. Uh, they are open and anybody can look at them. So I'm coming towards the end of the talk. I want to show you some uh, images of uh, the ExoMars rover, uh, which is, uh, as Dave mentioned, um, it's, it's very uh, exciting. And as uh, Sue mentioned as well, it's, it's almost ready to go. Um, so here you see a movie of uh, the rover drilling. In this case, we were drilling at uh, 1.7 meter depth. I have to say that uh, these movies are greatly accelerated. Uh, in this part, the drilling is very slow. It would take us about five days to drill down to two meters. So the drill is, is like a mini oil platform and it can be raised and tilted to deliver the sample which then goes inside uh, Rosalind Franklin, has a, a very powerful analytical laboratory for analyzing the samples. So the, the drill has a, a piston that pushes the sample out into this uh, spoon or hand that then uh, moves inside. So here you see the back shell being lowered onto the lander. And now I want to come back to the landing site. Why is the landing site so important? We mentioned that we wanted to go to a place that was at least 4 billion years in age. And these are ancient planes on Mars uh, that are about that age, that are low enough for missions with parachutes to be able to land on. And uh, in the specific case of ExoMars, we have chosen a place called Oxyaplanum. What you see in red are large fields of clays. And this Oxyaplanum is believed to have been the coastal area of a very large ocean that existed on Mars about uh, 4.2, 4. Uh, up to 3.9 billion years ago. And of course, this is something that we will only be able to uh, demonstrate after landing. So just coming to the end, I want to show you again on this uh, very same slide that we saw at the beginning, where the ages of uh, the various missions that are going to Mars are. So Curiosity, which landed on Gale Crater, Gale Crater is dated at 3.6 uh, billion years in age. By then, uh, Mars was already starting to dry, even though uh, Gale Crater had some water inside its crater lake. Uh, by and large, the planet was uh, dry at that time. Perseverance, which is in Jezero Crater, another lake that had water, 
is dated at uh, 3.8 billion years in age. And Oxia planum, where Rosaline Franklin is supposed to go, is dated at 4 billion years in age. And you can see the clays are very, very old. Um, they are the oldest surfaces that we have discovered on Mars until today. So it would be a great place to go to, and the discoveries there would be amazing. So I want to finish with this uh, nice picture of uh, uh, the ExoMars team that have worked so hard to put the mission together. And um, um, as, as was said uh, several times today, if you like to work in space, Science is one way, engineering and learning about subsystem design is another way, but we have all kinds of people that contribute to uh, complex missions like ExoMars, uh, from people that do history, people that do contracts, lawyers. So if you like to work in space and, and you really are serious about it, uh, you, you can find a way no matter what it is that you decide to study. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jorge. That was fascinating. And actually, we have hundreds of questions that have come in for you. I know we won't have a chance to get to actually all of them. Actually hundreds. Yeah, literally <laughs> hundreds. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, just to kind of start off with, though, you, you've talked about drilling quite a lot, which is fascinating. And we heard earlier today a little bit about um, another mission, which uh, was called Insight. And we heard a little bit about sort of ideas to drill with that. Can you tell us about some of the challenges associated with drilling on Mars? Maybe a little bit about sort of what, um, how, how the drills work and, and why it's so challenging. Well, drilling is, is tough, mainly because you don't know what it is that you're going to drill into. So if you happen to drill into what is called regolith, so the loose material that low gravity bodies have, then it's very easy to advance through that. It's like, like drilling in the, on the beach. But uh, th that material is not really interesting. What you're really interested in getting into are sedimentary deposits, particularly of the type that would have been deposited in water. And those are harder. Yeah. And so um, the trick to drill into hard material is to drill very, very slowly. Because if you try to go fast, you get stuck. Have you tried to drill into cement in your house? If you go too fast, your drill bit gets stuck and you break it. So drilling is very challenging. And, and you know, when things are difficult, typically they require big stuff. And that's why the drill on ExoMars is so large. Great stuff. So we've got a question from Buttercup class, aged four to six years old. They would like to know, have any of the robots broken on Mars? They always break in the end. I mean, they work <laughs> until they don't. Um, so typically what happens is we design them for what we call a nominal mission. Um, and, but since we want to be sure we can achieve that, then we test them for a lot more than what that nominal mission would last. And I'll give you an example. The Spirit and Opportunity rovers of NASA were designed for 90 days of operation. And then they work for about 11 years. So if you do your things uh, well, you can get a lot of mission out of these machines. What kind of things break them? What are the, what are the sort of the, t the things that go wrong on, on these rovers? The, typically, the first thing to go are mechanisms. Um, Mars is full of dust and it even rains from the sky because at some times you have what, I, what we call the, the dust storm season. And even if we don't have global dust storms, there's just more dust in the air and that falls everywhere. So typically things that rotate or move, eventually dust will work into the mechanisms. And at some point, something will stop working. In the case of Spirit and Opportunity, they had problems with the wheels. I noticed on the Curiosity rover as well, the, the wheels really started to mm. fall apart after a while, the actual material that made up the wheels. Yes, right. that, that is because the, the tread surface of the Curiosity rover wheels was made in aluminium. For Perseverance, they changed that and they went to steel. So aluminium is a softer material and the, a lot of Mars is full of basalt, so volcanic rocks, which are typically very hard and jagged. So that, that uh, 
wreaked havoc with the, with the Curiosity's wheels. They have a few holes, but they're still doing okay. <laughs> So we've, we've heard a lot about sort of getting samples back from, from Mars to the Earth actually already today. And you've talked about things we can do on the surface. We also mentioned, and I'm sure we're gonna mention again, meteorites that land on the Earth that maybe come from Mars. So why do we have to get things from Mars and bring them back? Why aren't meteorites enough to give us the information we need to understand Mars? Actually, this is a great question. Meteorites are uh, very, very interesting, but we have very, very few meteorites from Mars. And unfortunately, we don't know exactly where it is they come from. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, I would venture to say that the ones that we have, although they're very informative, do not come from the type of rocks that we would like to analyze if we want to search for life. So yes, they give us a lot of uh, important clues, but uh, you know, those are not the rocks or not the droids you're looking for. Looking for. <laughs> you know what, I'm always, I'm always just blown away by the statistical improbability of finding a Martian meteorite. The idea that something would hit Mars, that it would eject rock, in, sort of into escape velocity so it would leave the planet somehow find its way to earth land somewhere and then be found by a human is to me just like how does that work well i guess you have to think also that uh, mars has been pummeled by meteorites for many hundreds of millions of years so the amount of material that has been sent out uh, into space is is pretty colossal as well I've always wanted to be on one of those expeditions that goes to Antarctica and searches for meteorites. That's my dream, is to go down to Antarctica and hunt for rocks from yeah. Mars. Or I elsewhere. think that's really interesting, actually. Yeah. The, 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 perhaps, Jorge, you could explain why is it that we go to Antarctica and, and sort of desert areas? Why do we find meteorites here? It, actually, the answer is, is, is disappointingly simple. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because the meteorites are dark, and if you're looking for, for them against a, a white or a light color background, they're much easier to spot. Yeah. So they're landing all, all over the Earth, but right. they're tricky. If one lands in your back garden, you might not how spot it. How would you it. know? Yeah, well, how would you know? Yeah. Why didn't we find a meteorite in, in one in, uh, the, in the UK? The Winchcombe meteorite. The Winchcombe meteorite that's, in the UK. Mm -hmm. That's that's true, that was observed, but it was observed coming through as well. It was observed as it sort of entered the region with cameras, so then they could sort of plot where it landed. Um, wow. So that's pretty amazing. So Jorge, you've just convinced me that uh, we need to get samples back from Mars and that using meteorites isn't enough. Maybe you can talk a bit about why we would send humans to Mars and maybe what they could do that the amazing rovers and robots that we're sending can't do. Is there something that you need human fingers or brains to do? Well, I would say that an astronaut can do on Mars in one week what uh, a mission, a robotic mission can do in a year. Uh, the trick though is, so we are very adaptable and we are very good at recognizing uh, particularly things that are out of the common. Um, but in the case of Mars, there's one thing that is very important. I mean, we cannot be sure that there is not life there still. Um, if, if life appeared on Mars, and we're talking about microorganisms, when conditions went south on the surface, it would be very likely that they seek refuge in the subsurface. On Earth, if you drill looking for oil, even down two kilometers, you find that there are microorganisms still living in the subsurface, just munching minerals in eternal darkness. And as long as you have water and the right conditions, it is not inconceivable that we could still have life on Mars today. So uh, we don't want to be remembered as a species that went to another planet and wiped out all the life uh, there. So we have to be very, very careful that we understand uh, if there is life on Mars still today, and if there is, we should treat it with respect and with care. So we have to be sure that if we send astronauts to Mars, which would be emitting Earth microbes in all directions. Very that, clean uh, astronauts we need. We need to... Well, you know, even with the best astronaut suits, every time you move your arms, you have jets of, 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 of stuff coming out in, 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 in all directions. So... Um, 
Yeah, I, I'm all for uh, sending astronauts to Mars, but uh, we should think carefully about you know how how we deploy astronauts in a way that we can earn the maximum, and and also preserve what might be there for future generations to be able to study as well. You talk about sort of bringing samples back, right? Either people bringing samples back, or maybe the the sample return mission that we spoke about. And thinking about potential life on Mars, I don't think we need to think about when we bring these samples back from Mars, like what if there is life in these samples and we bring it back? How do we treat it when it gets back to the Earth to make sure that it doesn't get contaminated by ours and maybe we don't contaminate mm -hmm. it? Yeah, there is actually a, a whole discipline that is called planetary protection that uh, deals with these sort of things. And, and uh, there is a special category defined for uh, samples that are returned from uh, a body that has the potential for life, whether present or past. And, and that specifically applies to Mars sample return missions. And so there is uh, a, a very stringent protocol that has to be followed, um, both in terms of cleanliness to go there, but also for the the samples, they have to be enclosed in, in double containment. You have to make sure that that containment uh, cannot be breached, even uh, where there, you know, something to malfunction in the return capsule. Everything has to be safe. And um, once the samples arrive on Earth, they have to be put in a special containment facility where nobody's able to access them or touch them. You have to operate from the outside with this uh, uh, remote controlled instrumentation and, and these gloves uh, that, that you operate from the outside. So it's a fascinating uh, area in itself. And uh, so people are paying a lot of attention to this. There's a movie there, isn't there? There's some kind of sci-fi movie where it all goes badly wrong. <laughs> I, I they always go bad, yeah. A, coming out of a pandemic, I'm just imagining the Martian variant next. Of like, oh, oh, no, no. don't say that. <laughs> we actually have one of those um, uh, double world isolators downstairs, so maybe we'll have a wander around the space oh, park a bit later ah, and, have, and have a look at it. Interesting. Actually, there was, just very quickly, uh, you, you might remember, Jorge, um, maybe sort of 20 years ago, the, the Alan Hills meteorite. There's a, mm -hmm. a famous meteorite and they thought they discovered a, 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 a sort of bacteria or some kind of worm structure in it. And everyone got very excited. And I remember President Bill Clinton at the time standing in the Rose Garden announcing that we may have found life on Mars. And then it turned out not to be the case. It's very exciting to get excited about that. But I know you scientists have to be quite cautious about announcing such things. Yeah, I mean, uh... Carl Sagan once said that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the scientific community is naturally very skeptical when it comes to, uh, you know, discoveries of, of life. Uh, so, um, yeah, we'd have to be sure before uh, opening our, our mouths with uh, uh, some sort of pronouncement like that. Yeah. And I would say that um, what you what you would need is you would need evidence from several different angles, and by that I mean several different instruments that cannot be explained by any other means than by the presence of life. And uh, so I think people sometimes ask me, "Where were you to land with a mission like uh, ExoMars? What are the chances?" And I would say three things. The chances of finding organic molecules are 100% because we know they're there and Curiosity found them. Most likely they're meteoritic and uh, on the surface and have nothing to do with life, but who knows? The, finding of, the chances of finding something that is suggestive of uh, the possibility of life, I think that's like 50%. We may find something where we say, oh, this is interesting. It, 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 it could have been life, but the chances of being able to demonstrate that you found traces of life, that, that I think is, well, 10%. I mean, you have to be lucky there. Many things a, have to align just right. It's a really interesting exercise to think about it, actually. Like how would you, you know, if, if some of the young people are, are watching this might want to think about that. How would you, if you think you'd found life, how would you prove it? I just suddenly, you mentioned Carl Sagan. I was just reaching for my Carl Sagan there. Like you, Carl was very optimistic about, about the chances of finding 
past life on Mars. But you know, like he was said, he was my professor or one of my oh, professors right, okay, when I studied in the US. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Jorge. We could keep going for hours because honestly, the number of questions we have for you is numbering in the hundreds at this point. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. That was really a fascinating really presentation. Lovely, You've yeah. got everyone well, really excited about future life on Mars. Thank you, guys. And, and congrats, because this is super interesting. Thank Good. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, Jorge. Great. Well, you know.